Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is going to be a bit of a, a stream of consciousness video, this one. I've had a few people reach out to me and ask me what my thoughts on the announcement that Warlord Games made at their open day, probably about a month ago now, that their next Napoleonic supplement for black powder would be based around the campaigns of 1813. The Wars of Liberation or Napoleon at Bay or any of those things that you can, uh, you can call it. Now, this one's going to be just basically me talking. The images are not going to be very interesting. I might just bang out some uh, some random images that I've found. So do listen to this while you're doing some painting. Or maybe you've got it on in the background while you're cooking dinner or something like that. There's not really going to be much to see here. Even less than normal. Now for those of you who have not seen the announcement. It is available on the Warlord Games YouTube channel. And it's in their live Q&A. It's got John Stollard, who's the managing director or CEO or whatever he calls himself, the owner guy of Warlord Games. And Paul Sawyer, some of you may remember him as Fat Bloke in White Dwarf. I certainly do, very fondly. And they're talking about what's next for Warlord Games. And he says that it's, it's currently being, it's already been written, it's currently being edited, so the next one's going to be 1813. Now, I think there's some pluses and minuses for this one uh, i'm going to start off with i'm going to do what's called a compliment sandwich for those of you who've seen family guy so i'm going to start off with something that's good about it i'm going to interject in the middle with something that i'm perhaps not so impressed with and then we'll finish off with a positive as well i don't want this to be a bashing video there's plenty of those out there there's plenty of people who have a downer on warlord games just for existing i'm not one of those but nor am i a shill that's going to automatically say that everything they do is great contrary to what some people think they don't pay me i mean i'm open <laughs> i'm open to being paid by them but they currently don't so i can be very open and unbiased with my opinion so the first thing is that it's really good because it's a continuation from a clash of eagles so clash of eagles was the last napoleonic book that they did and that one was about the war of 1812 not the war of 1812 in america but the uh, the conquest of russia or the invasion of russia and all that good stuff there. Now, that was really good because it brought the Russians and the Austrians into the black powder game system. We already had the British, the Prussians, and the French, obviously. But um, yes, it allowed some other nations and a whole host of minor nations as well. The Bavarians, the Italians, the Confederation of the Rhine, all of these different nations, they all got a uh, Duchy of Warsaw. They all got uh, army lists in there as well. So, what I really liked about 1812 is that rounded out all of the nations that were around in the late War of the Napoleonic period. I can't think of any, with the possible exception of Britain and Spain, and Portugal I suppose, that aren't in Clash of Eagles. And with Portugal, Spain and Britain, you've obviously got Albion Triumphant Volume 1 with those guys. Anyone who's not caught up in that, such as like the Dutch-Belgians and nations that became shall we say, um, not under the Napoleon's control by 1815. Most of those are in the Waterloo book. So really all we'd had to go on was the War of 1812. They didn't have any uh, any good stuff. The Americans and the Canadians. Or maybe further afield, we've done a book here on the channel for the Ottomans or perhaps even the Indians. So it meant that there wasn't a huge amount of places to go in late war. By bringing out a book for 1813, then they've progressed on the story, as it were, from 1812, we had the retreat from Moscow, now we've got 1813, we've got the Allies resurgent, and the Allies chasing Napoleon all the way back to Paris. Now, we've obviously got some major, major battles in this period as well, including one that I would love to see have its, it have it, you know, every dog has its day, I'd love to see this battle have its day. And that would be Leipzig, an absolutely humongous battle. It'd be interesting to do a great game style game of Leipzig. Maybe with different games around Europe or the world. That'd be awesome. But anyway, anyway, that's 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 getting way off topic. So we've got major battles, as I say, we've got that one. We've got Lutzen and Bautzen, we've got Dresden, we've got some major, major uh, engagements. Some of the biggest that had ever happened up until that stage of world history as well. So it's certainly not a year in which nothing happened. Is it a year that deserves its own book? Uh, uh, and I'll come to that. I'll come to why later. So it continues the story on from 1812. It allows us to use the armies that we've raised for that campaign. And it's just a good way of moving the period forward. 
some of the less positive thing aspects to it are very much come out of that. It moves the period forward. It's stuff that we've already seen. Now, the problem is with having a book on 1813, and this it's a bit of an unusual one, is that there's nothing wrong in in of itself with having a book of 1813. I think it's a really cool idea. However, there are only certain amount of funds that can be funneled into you know research and development of these supplement books. For me, that time and money would have been be- much, much better spent on a different either theatre or period. Now, for me, obviously, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'd love to see the Ottomans versus the Wahhabist War. I think that'd be amazing. Like, <laughs> I don't think they're going to be doing a Black Powder book on the Ottoman Wahhabist War. I really don't. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to tell you guys. But there are other commercial periods out there. 1805 would have been an obvious example. 1809, a little more problematic. I'll come to why in a in a sec- in a second. We could have had the Revolutionary Wars again, probably similar to 1809. The, the issues there, or we could have had, say, the War of 1812, and completely gone to a different theatre there. Now, personally, I'm glad they didn't do the War of 1812. We've got two books on the British already, and there's an excellent fan-made War of 1812 supplement. I start putting one together, and found this one on the camp uh, the niagara campaign and that blows out the water anything that i was trying to do so uh, try and uh, uh, google search the niagara campaign black powder something like that and that'll come up it's absolutely phenomenal highly recommended so i'm quite glad they didn't do that we've already got two books of british i don't think we needed a third one now i can understand why they didn't do 1809 and to uh, you know the similar extent Things like 1798 or 1800. So I'm thinking about the battles of Valmy or the Battle of Marengo at that one. And the reason why I don't think they did those, and they explain it in the video of the the sort of the Q and A press conference thing, is that they don't do models for that army at the moment. So they don't make any Austrian models. So that would make 1809 not the best thing to do. Now, there's, that kind of begs the question, to be honest. I think it does anyway. If you say, we're not going to do the 1809 campaign, but because we don't make any Austrian models, well, surely the obvious uh, then next question is, why don't you make any Austrian models? Now, they there are other manufacturers out there that do, the Perrys and Victrix, of course. That's never stopped Warlord in the past. They brought out their French plastic French Hussars when the Perry ones have been out for two or three years already. So the question really is asked, well, why don't they do something like that? Now, I think they've missed the boat on this already. The Perrys now do plastic Austrian infantry. They've done that for quite a while. They do plastic cavalry. And they don't do plastic artillery yet, but I'm sure Victrix won't be too far away from doing that. Victrix also do grenadiers in plastic, which is something that the Perrys don't do. They have metal um, metal heads that you convert them with. And they've got regular line infantry as well, either with helmets or shakos. So, Warlords... I, I'm going to use a loaded term. Warlord's excuse for not doing something like the War of 1809 is the Danube campaign, the war against Austria, is that they don't do the figure range for them. So, that's fair enough. I think that's a reasonable argument to make. They are, at the end of the day, a miniatures company. They're not a rules writing company. So, that's fair enough. However, let's dig into that statement a little bit more. If we look at the War of 1812 that they've brought a book out for, well, we can look at what they do for that line. So they do the French. I think that's fair enough. They they also do 1809 French as well. Now, yeah, they're not the great, the best models in the world, but they do do them. So the French, we can say, well, the French for 1809, 1812, they're equally well served. You've got the Hussars and all that stuff that Warlord Games do. So that's fine. You've got the Russians that they do. Now, they do Russian artillery. I, I'll be honest with you. They do really nice uh, Russian artillery. And they do Russian infantry and that's it they do pavlovsky grenadiers as well so that's again a metal head add-on similar to the uh, the peri austrian grenadiers that's it they don't do any russian cavalry whatsoever either in plastic in this new weird rest tech thing that they've got or just straight up resin or metal so for them to say well we don't do uh we don't do any austrians well okay you do a box of russian infantry so you're a box of austrians behind I'm fairly certain that, you know, a company the size of Warlord could just about get around to making some Austrians. In addition to that, in the book 
Clash of Eagles, the 1812 book, you've got, as I previously mentioned, an entire plethora of armies that Warlord games don't make miniatures for. So, for instance, Württemberg would be a great example. Württemberg's got Jaegers, Line, Lights, um, Guard, Foot Guard, Horse Guard, Dragoons. Have they got Karaziers? They might, I don't think they've got Karaziers. Uh, but they've got chasseurs or, you know, so there's a whole range of models there, a full army that they don't do any figures for. Yet they've got rules in Clash of Eagles. Bavarians would be another great example. Victrix have just brought out their Bavarian infantry. Warlord don't make any Bavarians, but they've got rules in Clash of Eagles. So you don't even have to look at the more obscure nations. You've got the sort of the second line powers there. You've got countries like Bavaria, the Duchy of Warsaw, Saxony, these nations that all have armies, Saxony's not so bad, you can use French troops for those, but you know, the Saxon Guard, you can't, Saxon uh, Guard de Corps, the Cavalry, the Zristau Kraziers, or whatever, they're called, Zaptau Kraziers, whatever they're called, the Kraziers, you can't use those for them, the Duchy of Warsaw, okay, they do a Vistula Legion box, which isn't particularly Vistula Legionary, but it's certainly not very Duchy of warsaw either, so they do do armies in the War of 1812 book, in the Clash of Eagles book, that they don't do figures for. So that makes the excuse of, we decided to do 1813 instead of 1809, because we don't do figures for 1809, that rings rather hollow to me, to be honest. Similarly, with 1805, they could have done. Now, they don't do any mid-war French, so fair enough. They don't do the French with bicorns. Okay, fair. They do, however, do early Russians, they don't do any Austrians, as previously mentioned. So if they did do a box of Austrians, similar to the Perrys, you could put the helmets and the shakers in the same box. There you go, bang, you've got your battalion of Austrians. And they're useful from 1805 right through to 1815. You could even put those weird cask things that they've got with the, uh, the front, uh, and you could even use them for revolutionary period as well. So there's absolutely no excuse, I don't think, for Warlord to... To turn around and say, well, you know, we don't make models for 1809, so we haven't done a book for 1809. Well, one, make the models. Two, you've done 1812. And I guarantee the armies in 1813, they're basically the same armies. There's going to be tons of those that you don't do minis for as well. So I'm afraid that excuse doesn't really wash with me. The reason why I put forward Warlord Games have decided not to do either 1809 or 1805 is that they are... Not scared, but they are more cautious about doing an early period of the Napoleonic Wars. And to be honest, I think that's a little bit silly. One of the problems we've got in the UK is that we are very British-centric when it comes to wargaming and history in general. One of the problems of having, uh, yeah, I'm sorry to say, of having a very, very successful uh, nation when militarily is that we can always focus on the wars and the battles that we were involved in and that we won. Because we're involved and we won a load of them. Something that I was watching the other day was Epic History TV's uh, series on the Prussian-Austrian War. And I've got the, Aust the Franco-Prussian War one lined up. And I didn't know anything at all about these wars. Despite, I'm sure, some of my European listeners will be like, well, how can you not know anything about it? It's the massive war that shaped... Europe for the next 200 years. I'm like, well, yeah, because <laughs> Britain wasn't involved. We don't really hear that much about it. It's the same with the 30 Years' War. We don't really hear much about that in this country. So that makes me think that's why later Napoleonics is more popular. Warlord Games, of course, is a British company. So it is skewed by its own biases and you know what, what we consider to be popular here. I think something like 1805, 1809 would have been much more popular in Europe. Now, it's not for me to say what the market's like in Europe compared to the UK. This is all highfalutin business stuff. But there's an element to me of, you know, Field of Dreams style, build it and they will come. There wasn't a huge amount of interest in 28 mil American Civil War or even 28 mil Napoleonics until the Perrys, Victrix and Warlord came along with their plastics and made the market for themselves. There's other companies who have always done 20 mils, places like uh, Front Rank or Foundry, although they're more 25 mil, or uh, Elite Miniatures, Connoisseur. Co companies like this have always done 28 mil, but because they've been metal, particularly Foundry, they are a lot more expensive. It was the Perrys who came along with their Plastic America Civil War that completely revolutionised the, the modern wargaming scene, in my opinion, anyway. 
But if you do an 1809 box and you do a starter set and you do starter armies and you bang all that out and you tell your reps to push them to third party stores, you advertise in War Games Illustrated and you know you do YouTube videos showing these things, you can create the demand for a product. I, I, I believe anyway. So that for me is the, the negative of doing 1813 is there is an opportunity cost in them doing that. And in this case, it's what I would consider a more interesting book, 1809, 1805. And the reason I say they're more interesting is because they're very different from the late war. One's mid-war, one's a turning point of the war. Um, so you've got, you know, even simple things like there being six companies in a French battalion. Well, at Austerlitz, there's eight companies in a French battalion and things like that. So... No, it doesn't really mean much on the battlefield, but they are very different armies, and you could have different special rules. You could have a whole new host of special characters, Marshal Lan, or um, La Salle, you know, who I love, or, you know, uh, Despania, all these great French commanders who, you know, you just, you just don't get them in the late war. So that, for me, is a real, real shame. It's a missed opportunity. I'm sure Austerlitz will come, but... How long has it been since Clash of Eagles? Four or five years? So we're going to be looking at least that until the next book. What if the next book's 1814? Now we're looking at, what, 10 years before we're going to get an Austerlitz book? I don't really think that's acceptable. I think as a community, we should... we should. Uh, to be honest, I think as a community, we should start looking at making our own. Now, if that's something that would interest you, then let me know. And uh, we can look at maybe doing some playtesting or something like that. But unfortunately... I think Warlord, by releasing this 1813 book, have said anyone who's interested in early or mid-war, you're kind of on your own on that one. And I think that's a real shame. I think it shows a lack of ambition. I think it shows a lack of understanding of the period. And I just I just think it's, it's the safe, the easy, safe, lazy option. And I don't like to see companies take that. But that said, I said we were going to finish on a on a plus as well. And this then leads into the previous, uh, put the negative point, which is where I said, well, it begs the question, why don't you make these uh, these sets? Maybe they will start making these sets. As I say, something like Duchy of Warsaw Infantry, I'd love to see those in plastic. Or Saxon Grenadiers, I'd love to see those in plastic. Oh, I would absolutely love to see Saxon Grenadiers in plastic. Those of you who haven't seen, I did a video a few weeks ago on the sets that we need to see in hard plastic. And, you know, some of them I didn't think were that, that viable. Certainly, Duchy of Warsaw could be. Uh, I'm not sure how viable plastic uh, Saxon Grenadiers would be, but, uh, you know, you never know. Uh, and there's other things that I think they could do. I mean, one of the big things that there's not really much out there, the only company I know that make them is Front Rank, and that is Russian Guard. I've not seen, it, seen any uh, non-Front Rank Russian Guard out there. Uh, I did have see a Russian manufacturer... But uh, I'm not sure if you did Guard Infantry, and I'm not entirely sure how easy it is to get hold of those anymore. But uh, yeah, so uh, things like that, Russian Guard Infantry in plastic would be fantastic. Or, as I say, uh, Duchy of Warsaw would be great. You could even have Italians, and they're very similar to uh, the French, but you know, why not? You could have a head variation. They've done the Hanoverians and the British, and they're basically the same, just with different heads. So that's certainly doable. So it means that with this commitment to late war Napoleonics, then I'm hoping that they will double down on that and they will start releasing more sets that are for that period. I don't know if they will or not. It's a little bit of a of a hope rather than expectation, but uh, but we'll have to see how that goes. So that's it. So those are my thoughts on uh, Warlord Games' next 1813 book. Will I be buying it? You bet your sweet A I will be. I'll definitely be buying it and we'll delve into the rules and things like that am i disappointed i am disappointed that it's not something a little bit more daring and a little bit more exciting but it is what it is and i think it gives the community room to start looking at making our own book well that's it thank you very much for listening and i shall catch you guys next time